Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the concept of spiritual entities. Do they exist? Are they useful? Is it helpful to even think about spiritual entities? With me is Professor Jorge Ferrer, who is a core faculty member in the Department of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is also the author of several books, including Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, a Participatory Vision of Human Spirituality, and he is a co-editor of an anthology called The Participatory Turn, Spirituality, Mysticism, and Religious Studies, and his most recent book is called Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essays in Psychology, Education, and Religion. Welcome again, Jorge. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. And now we're going to get into a, a topic of great fascination to me as a parapsychologist. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about spiritual entities, I think we can look at it uh, philosophically, like ontologically. Do they actually exist or are they projections from our own mind and mm -hmm. pragmatically as as well, what what value do we find in mm -hmm. uh, even thinking in terms of spiritual entities? Exactly, and this I think you're raising the right the right questions, you know, about the spiritual entities. And um, I mean, for me, like um, there is no doubt that um, there is like some kind of like uh, practical implications, practical impact of contact with the spiritual entities, mm -hmm. and that could be uh, reportedly positive or negative. Mm -hmm. um, so there is like some encounters that have brought tremendous gifts and uh, spiritual edification and transformation to people, even yeah. forms of awakening. There are other encounters that uh, some people have reportedly some negative consequences. Yes. So it seems like uh, whatever the ontological status, there is a tremendous variety of mm -hmm. diversity of uh, so-called spiritual entities or not physical entities. Mm -hmm. Just as there is a diversity of uh, physical entities, exactly. people, animals, plants. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. But it seems like uh, uh, I, I think I've been very lucky in the sense that uh, all my encounters have been very benign and very positive for mm -hmm. me. Although I have heard uh, many people telling it, even shamans and uh, people pretty advanced, like saying, well, don't trust any disembodied entity that you come across. Yeah. Some of them may not have your best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. But in my case, at least all of the encounters like uh, were uh, spiritually healing, edifying, and transformative. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a long tradition of spiritual entities associated with healing. Yes. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as spirit doctors. And, and as I was describing to you earlier, I had visited a uh, spiritual community in uh, Brazil near mm -hmm. Rio de Janeiro uh, called Frei Luis, where uh, they claimed and showed me photographs mm -hmm. that they have seances, a medium goes mm -hmm. into trance, mm -hmm. spiritual doctors materialize out of ectoplasm, yes. they can be photographed, then these spirit doctors actually perform mm -hmm. surgeries. Yes, uh, I have seen this with my own eyes, although I'm not sure if they are the same spirit doctors that that community see, yeah. but I saw that with my own eyes in a um, ayahuasca ceremony um, and the with the Shipibos in the Amazons, I was there for a month, and uh, and essentially, like, uh, basically, it was like a complete darkness in the room. And then, uh, from where the Shipibo healer was singing, I started seeing like this, like, thread of light. And the threat of life would go to the last corners of the maloka, the ceremonial hut. And from that threat of light, I, I would see with my own eyes, like, how, like, different, um, Entities that later I learned they were called spirit doctors or mm -hmm. astral doctors came into the room. They were tangibly taller than human beings. They were made of fuzzy light, uh, but they had definitely 
legs and arms, and they would move around the room with apparent autonomous volition, and even more, they would go in front of each practitioner and they would put like their hands into their heart chakra and sometimes into their lower chakra, like in the belly, you know. And I would see this going on, and when my turn arrived, uh, I was kind of like, a, immediately I felt like a sense of like their benevolence, and I felt a sense of like I can fully trust uh, because they're here to, to heal. And as they put contact in those centers, I could feel very tangibly, <coughs> excuse me, very tangibly, the kind of like a super refined spiritual surgery they were doing, adjusting those centers, like doing this really alignments and adjustments of like a tremendous precision, you know, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, after that, um, you know, the rest, you know, it, it, it had an impact had an impact and this is also something very important whatever their <coughs> ontolo excuse me <coughs> ontological status we can attribute to those entities uh, the fact that they can have such a healing impact on human yeah. beings that in itself is fascinating back in the 90, early 70s there was a book uh, Arigo the surgeon with the rusty knife about yes. a, a different Brazilian uh, mm -hmm. medium who, who mm -hmm. had spirit doctors well documented mm -hmm. uh, by the medical community, by Dr. Andrea Puharic at uh -huh. the time, who, who was a professor of surgery at New York University. Uh -huh. But now let me ask you this about your experience. You, you were in a, a special location called a Maloka. Yes. And there were other people with you. Yes. Uh, including shamans. Yes. And including other observers. Correct. And were you the only one who witnessed this? Well, this is exactly, you know, uh, what was my question, like, uh, that night and the morning after, because uh, I'm a researcher as well, as I was a participant, that I'm a researcher, and I'm very interested in these things. So, uh, in the morning, I went to the main shaman who was leading the ceremony, and I asked, I shared some of my experience, and I asked, like, um, are this, is this something that, that, that you see, uh, that you saw last night, and then, like, very naturally, he looked at me, nodding his head, oh, yeah, the, um, the astral doctors were here last night, uh, and they not, they don't always come, he said, they don't always come, but sometimes they do come, and last night was one of those nights that they were here. Uh, I checked with other participants that day, and, uh, no other people saw them, uh, right? It's you and the shaman. Yes, in that particular case. Yeah. But I did experience other occasions, so, uh, with a different medicine called Wachuma San Pedro, that is very close to my heart. I work with this medicine, of course, only in countries in which it's legal. But, uh, with this medicine, like, I uh, had several experiences of me and the shaman and other participants like uh, being able to intersubjectively agree and see not only different uh, auras, energies, energy vortexes, energy movements, but also spiritual entities, mm -hmm. disembodied entities. And uh, some of those participants were completely naive. There was like this young lady who uh, was the, her first time drinking San Pedro. And at some point in the ceremony, I was looking in the corner and I was looking this this indigenous guy like in, in cochleas, like she think like and it looked like was he smoking a cigarette and I was like what is that and and, and it was like it was not a it was not an embodied indigenous person mm -hmm. there and I would I would point uh, to um, the lady that I was with my researcher hat on I would point in mm -hmm. that direction without describing at all what I was saying I would tell what do you see there and she would say uh, looks like an indigenous person is smoking a cigarette stuff like that you know mm -hmm. so that went for several hours two or three hours of like uh, I call the whole episode Harry Potter meets the Matrix <laughs> it, was, it was really magic and uh, yeah. energy energy fields that we could play with you know mm -hmm. like a la Carlos Castaneda uh, I've seen my teacher put a ball of energy throw yeah. it and someone will catching it yeah. you know so basically San Pedro it seems as well as other medicines it can open the eye what what it looks like is the energetic dimension of reality that mm -hmm. it seems seen from that perspective that it's always around us, but our uh, normal eye uh, has not been evolutionarily uh, adapted mm -hmm. to see in normal circumstances because needs yeah. to see what happens for survival, right? It needs to see mm -hmm. the dangers of the prayers, you know, and so forth, you know. So, uh, and the indigenous people, you know, consensually, quite consensually across the globe, they say that their medicines, they can produced can lead to the emergence of um, this kind of a special uh, enhanced 
uh, perception, you yeah. know, they, they call it true seeing, uh, stargazing, second sight, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have all these different names, people from tribes very disconnected in the world, you know. Yeah. And then they say many of them, they also have like these spirit helpers, you know. So it seems there is an anthropological, pretty consensual evidence that, uh, that something is going on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm reminded of, of an interesting case in the parapsychology mm -hmm. literature I presume you're probably not familiar with, but it, it's an interesting case to look at here. Mm -hmm. A group in Toronto uh -huh. uh, from the Society for Psychical Research in Toronto where they, they were studying spiritual seances mm -hmm. and they decided to perform a unique experiment where mm -hmm. they created a fictional story about oh. a ghost they named Philip who, oh. who had a very tragic life and was now uh, haunting. And then they would hold the seance and they would have rapping. Mm -hmm. They'd say, Philip, uh, answer these questions. Uh -huh. One rap for yes, two raps for no, something like, uh -huh. like that. And they entered into a dialogue mm -hmm. with a ghost who would answer questions yes. that were consistent with the story they had made up. Uh -huh. And their conclusion was that this was a psychokinetic manifestation. Mm -hmm. They even did acoustical studies mm -hmm. of the raps mm -hmm. to determine that they couldn't have been produced the normal mm -hmm. way like this mm -hmm. because the acoustical signature was different. Yes. So uh, it does suggest that we actually have the power to mm -hmm. produce what uh, would appear to be spiritual entities mm -hmm. uh, by our own consciousness. Yes, that could be the case. But uh, what um, what strike me as a potential uh, counter argument uh, yes. to that, you know, my sense is that everything can happen that, that there may be some spiritual entities that are somehow co-created with human consciousness mm -hmm. or created there might be others that may be more independent I think yes. there could be a whole diversity of phenomena mm -hmm. and it's important to be yeah, I'm disturbing. certainly not suggesting that yes. every <laughs> purported spiritual entity was created by the yes. people who saw it I understand just that that's one that's possibility absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and uh, what something that like in my mind like uh, brings some kind of like a uh, problematization to to that notion if it's taken in a more general way to to describe uh, uh, the presence of the, the the reality of those entities as projections is like sometimes uh, for example I'm just thinking like the, the whole research of Stanislav Kroth yes. right in which many many people um, reportedly and I've experienced things like that myself like they can't really access to uh, in this case for example like uh, symbolism you know or, mm -hmm. or entities from different traditions yeah. that they have never studied before they mm -hmm. have no intellectual biographical um, access to them right. and then they have these encounters and they can describe their esoteric uh, meaning precisely as is understood yeah. by the traditions themselves. Uh -huh. People who are completely naive, you know, like people who have never studied the Kabbalah, yeah. for example, they could like describe like the, the, the specific archetypal flavor of each one of the sephirots of the tree of life of the mm -hmm. Kabbalah, you know, yeah. or the meaning of the colors of the Tibetan mandalas who are very specific, right, mm -hmm. and so forth, you know. So this kind of, for me, like uh, the same with certain entities, I guess, can, can be seen certain daikinis, you know, that have like you know, very precise, like, meaningfulness, right, in the traditions. Can like, you define that term, Dakini? Pardon, uh, yes, of course. Dakini is normally like a, a consort in Tantric Buddhism, you know, yes. and that consort could be a human being, but also could be a subtle being. Uh -huh. And normally the highest f forms of, like, a practice in the Tibetan Buddhist with the Dakini or with subtle Dakinis, uh -huh. you know, right? And there are many different types of Dakinis. Some of them are fierce and, and come with knives and some, some yeah. of like Kali-like, other times are like super sweet. And so in any case, uh, some of in those, in those reports, like you consistently see in many cases, like people describing uh, qualities and having knowledge that only esoteric practitioners of those traditions would have. Yeah. And uh, some people have said, well, maybe this is like cryptomnesia, you know. Yes. Some people have read something, you know, in you know ge National Geographic you know, about this. Cryptomnesia is yeah. where people speak a language that they never learned. Yes, for example, uh -huh. right. Or where people um, remember something, rem 
say something that they have forgotten, but at some point they were exposed to. Oh, okay. So, for example, in this particular case, like maybe someone read an article in National Geographic about Tibetan Buddhism when 30 years ago, and yeah. he totally forgot. Oh, okay, that's cryptomnesia. Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, now I was thinking of xenoglossy. Yes, that's xenoglossy, speaking yes. the language you <laughs> exactly. have <learned. laughs> Exactly. Right. So, so and, and again, it raises that question, how do we know yes. you never learned? Yes, but in some mm -hmm. cases, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to that the Kitonisha process will explain some cases. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you were, you were saying well, something. Well, when we talk about spiritual entities, a little earlier, mm -hmm. you were describing what I would call energies. You said you could yes. manipulate the energies. Now, yes. I presume you're talking about some sort of uh, uh, visual patterns that you could see and and kind of play with yes basically what I, what one's experience with wachuma for example is like as if is the amazing is retraining physiologically your eye to unfocus uh, its sight on objects and gets focus on the space between objects where normally we don't see anything. Yeah. From here is where you want to start kind of start saying like what is start feeling like a spider webs of energy that suddenly start kind of like becoming more and more uh, colorful and visible and tangible, mm -hmm. and you can uh, even interact with other practitioners with those spider webs. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like a kind of like a um, intersubjective kind of like a interaction with those energies. You know, mm -hmm. to the extent that as I mentioned before, there has been cases of saying in which my teacher teach a ball of energy, yeah. throwing it, and someone catching it. Yeah. <laughs> so. That we we could call that a spiritual energy. Energies. Would, yes. would you distinguish between a spiritual energy and a spiritual entity? Absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. uh, in the sense that the spiritual entity, uh, in contrast to the energies, yes. uh, has apparently like uh, autonomous volition, uh -huh. autonomous intentionality, autonomous intelligence and wisdom, and interacts with you like as an autonomous being, as we're interacting mm -hmm. you and I. You know another. Um, just very brief uh, encounter I had during another watch my journey in which uh, I felt all these beautiful energies went into my body and healing and I was in my knees crying of gratitude mm -hmm. and uh, there were my teacher and a few other participants there and suddenly I was in the floor and I felt like like they were from my uh, armpits uh -huh. They were like helping me to come up. Uh -huh. I immediately assumed that it was my teacher and some of the other participants and uh -huh. I open my eyes and I see them there and then I look right and left and I see two indigenous spirit entities. Uh -huh. uh, but I felt them before physically in my armpits yeah. and only when I look right and left I could see them and how they, and they, they pulled me out. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I've had many of these encounters, and uh, like like you, like I always, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trained in science and trained in critical thinking. I try to look for uh, different explanations, and I'm, I'm open to different uh, ontological explanations. I think that some of these entities may might be autonomous. Some of them may be like somehow co-created with human consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I ask my students. Uh, are they, did the kinis exist uh, as an autonomous entities before Buddhists walked the world? Yeah. Right? An interesting question. Mm -hmm. Are the Christian angels yeah. existed if people encountered before Christianity ever mm -hmm. emerged in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that are very legitimate questions and we have different answers to that, right? Depending on yeah. how we understand religion and our relationship to it. Mm -hmm. We talked in a previous conversation about animism, which yes. many people say that's the oldest uh, religious belief mm -hmm. and it's found amongst indigenous peoples today everywhere. Yes. Everywhere indigenous people exist. And, and the idea is uh, that everything is alive, mm -hmm. that spiritual entities, spiritual energies permeate everything. Yes. Uh -huh. Exactly. That there is an interiority, you know, to, to, to the earth, to, to the plants, to, yeah. to the rocks, to the mountains. Yeah. Yes.
So, and there are many names mm -hmm. for, for them. Sometimes they're elementals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might say they are diamonds, or uh -huh. some people would call them demons yes. and <laughs> angels and deceased yes. ancestors. Yes. And, uh -huh. and then I think fascinatingly, like uh, in many indigenous uh, cultures and shamanic cultures and also Chinese uh, subcultures, there is like some people who reported having uh, spiritual marriages, even with those entities, yeah. that they last all their lives mm -hmm. and sometimes they have to uh, discuss with their uh, embodied wives or mm -hmm. husbands you know how to ne negotiate those uh -huh. two relationships uh -huh. <laughs> yeah and, and i suppose the funny thing from uh, a, a philosophical scientific perspective mm -hmm. looking at this to, to me the interesting analogy would be mm -hmm. physics yes. today where we have quarks and mm -hmm. gluons and, mm -hmm. and particles that physicists believe are absolutely real even though well sometimes it's a particle sometimes yes. it's a wave yes. <laughs> uh, but we can't see them directly mm -hmm. we only understand uh, their existence indirectly mm -hmm. through you know i think paths that they may make in a cloud chamber or a bubble chamber or sure. a, a um, particle accelerator where, where we see the tracks yes the particle we never have seen some of these particles directly although i do believe mm -hmm. that you can now photograph atoms mm -hmm. that's what they say yeah. <laughs> so um it's understandable that science is willing to acknowledge the mm. ontological reality of um, physical entities that are mm. invisible can cannot be mm -hmm. observed directly. In fact, mm -hmm. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle right. suggests that if we try to observe them, we yes. change them. We <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. For me, there is like two two um, avenues, you know, to further research uh, these phenomena that I think can. Uh, Place us, those of us who are interested in this phenomena, in a better platform to talk with scientists, you know. Mm -hmm. And one is the one we already touched upon here, it's about like to search for intersubjective agreement, you know, between more than one person, because it's very easy to dismiss any encounter with entities that people have with their eyes closed, having taken ayahuasca, well, that's a brain hallucination. Yeah. But when it's not just one or even two, or, but three or four people that with their eyes open are seeing the same energetic subtle phenomena mm -hmm. that science says do not exist. Yeah. Powers. We have, we need, I think there is like a powers there, you know, or at least a beginning of a different conversation. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, the other area as well, um, was about, um, you know, like documenting actually, um, in video certain of this phenomena. Yeah. For example, uh, in one of my last San Pedro ceremonies, uh, I think I shared this with you. I experienced, uh, for first time in my life, uh, what it looked like a telekinetic. Yes. Yes. So there was like this prism uh, hanging in, and they had like four witnesses. And then I was seeing this aura around this prism very strongly, very clear, very beautiful, all these colors. And uh, the prism was like hanging, hanging out uh, uh -huh, on a thread of some yes, sort. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. In a room with no, no, there was no windows open, no doors open. Uh, I was just there. And then the, the prince was hanging out here. And then I saw the aura and I just pinched the aura and, and just moved here and the object was moving like this. I pinched the aura from here and like a distance was like this, you know, mm -hmm. and the, 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 and then the several people who were sitting on the floor, they were like saying, holy shit, it's moving. Mm -hmm. So it was like something that not only I was saying, but that yeah. they were saying as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, the question is like, if we had, we had a camera as we had here there. Yeah would have been filmed that or not. Mm -hmm. And that's a question I want to explore in ne next ceremonies mm -hmm. uh, more more intentionally, like having cameras there and like going there and explore this more intentionally because I'm fascinated by that. It could be uh, yeah. fascinating. I think it would be interesting. And uh, as a parapsychologist, I know as soon as you come up with... Uh, Something like that, the critics will say, oh, you can easily fake That's, <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> I know, the, the, uh, but there is a, okay, I, I understand where you're yeah. coming from. As but, as a but that aside. That's right. I mean, <laughs> that's one thing, uh, one thing to, to try to film this as a document to, yeah. to show to scientists and tell them this is real. That's one dimension, but the other dimension is, 
just for me and for the people are yeah. like to, to really to really know what's going for on. People is, who is trust this, that it's not being faked. Yeah, what well, was this right like a collective vision that we had, but actually a camera didn't f didn't capture the object moving or mm -hmm. not. Or the actually the, right. the camera op captured the object moving and I bet my gosh that it was the latter. Well, as a parapsychologist, mm -hmm. the issue of exploring spiritual entities, which was a big issue back in the 19th century, mm -hmm. because it was the heyday of the spiritualist movement, That's and right. you had enormous... Uh, enthusiasm and interest in the general public. There were seances in uh, parlors, mm -hmm. hundreds, thousands, uh, mm -hmm. throughout Europe, South America, North mm -hmm. America, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course a great deal of fakery. But of course. that aside, you had many important mm -hmm. uh, scholars, scientific mm -hmm. and philosophical leaders of mm -hmm. their time investigating the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And they ended up I would say um, dividing into camps. Mm -hmm. Many of them became out-and-out -out spiritualists, uh -huh. but many of them determined for themselves that the phenomenon that they observed were mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. Things that you mentioned, for example, mm -hmm. cryptomnesia, even yeah. xenoglossy, yeah. mediums reporting uh, information they could not have known. Uh -huh by normal means. But then the mm. question is, was it mediated by a spirit or was it the extrasensory perception exactly. of the medium or other people in the room? Same exactly. thing with if a spirit manifests and uh, mm -hmm. uh, physically ectoplasm, is that an actual spiritual entity or is it an example of psychokinesis from a living person? No, it's, a, it's a great question. It's uh -huh. probably a question that I would be very, very hard to answer, right? Yes. Um, then even if uh, even if we take seriously, as I mentioned before, that there is an intersubjective agreement, you know, yeah. uh, still that question can be raised, right? Yes. Um, I was sharing with you before also that other encounter I had about like what it looked like a, a sage from China, yes. and then he appeared in front of me with this little bag, and then out of Ill, out he was giving me gifts, and out of mm -hmm. It's give he would give me it would be like a complete like a energetic transmission like yeah. a ex extremely strong right uh -huh. and uh, how, how to understand those things in this in this model that you're explaining like uh, I'm sure it, it can that be as well right well I, the problem is we don't know the outer limit right of normal psychic functioning from a, a talented human being that's right on the other hand it strikes me. Mm -hmm. If you look today at what's going on in uh, string theory and physics, mm -hmm. they're talking about uh, a universe that we live in, not of three dimensions That's of right. space, exactly. but of 11. Exactly. <laughs> and and if, if we're willing to acknowledge as virtually the uh, community of theoretical physicists, mm -hmm. thousands of them now working in string theory, they take these 11 dimensions to be physically real. Exactly. That, that to me, allows for at least the possibility of mm -hmm. uh, spiritual entities mm -hmm. who, who are very active mm -hmm. in uh, other dimensions of reality that mm -hmm. we know for sure exist, even though they are not visible to our eyes. Absolutely. Under you know, normal circumstances. Yes, and as an also neuroscientist saying that the human brain is like uh, it's made to actually perceive more than uh, six, seven dimensions, you know? Yeah. Like, and, uh, and that fits also with this kind of string theories idea or that there are other dimensions, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think kind of like holding as a, as a hypothesis, you know, because you cannot be very, obviously, very fine about any of these things, you know, uh, that the possibility that we might actually indeed live in a multidimensional cosmos, mm -hmm. you know, multidimensional cosmos and that, uh, that uh, you know, and the physical universe doesn't exhaust the possibilities of the yeah. real, you know. That's what we have been evolutionarily adapted to see in order for to us to survive, you know. Mm -hmm. This is what our science apparatus can catch, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a tremendous, uh, uh, it takes tremendous hubris also to say, well, because that's the only thing we can see with this evolutionary adaptation and our our scientific technology, nothing else exists, you know. Yeah. So I think we should be remain open to all those possibilities. At the same time, we need to be health, in a healthy way, skeptics, yeah. I think, as we both of us are, you know, and to really, like, um, 
try to find more and more ways, you know, to shed light on those phenomena and the nature of those entities, you know. My sense, the more entities have encounters, that they, they might be of different types, you know, some, the traditions talk about different types, like yes. ascended masters, maybe are there these entities uh, somehow connected with post-mortem scenarios? Yes. That's a big question, right? Yeah. And uh, many traditions seem to believe that way, you know, that when you die, you don't disappear in mm -hmm. nothingness, but many people or all go to different subtle realms or right. Buddha lands or heavens, and and maybe that's what those subtle realms are, or maybe those subtle realms uh, are kind of coexisting with this physical realm from the mm -hmm. very beginning. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people are saying today that the universe is not only expanding outward. It's expanding inward. Mm. Maybe it is like a, a notion of like that the expansion of the Big Bang is not just outward in the space, but inward in depths of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So who knows? Well, um, back uh, I think a hundred years ago or more, there was an interesting book called Flatland. Oh yes, written by Edward Abbott I, uh, or Edwin Abbott, mm -hmm. and. In, in this book, he's saying, what if we lived in a two-dimensional world, like uh, on a piece of paper? Right. And uh, we're interacting with three-dimensional entities, such as ourselves. They can put their finger here, lift it up, put it there, and it would appear that something appeared here and disappeared and then appeared there. And so a four, five, six-dimensional entity can interact in the three-dimensional world in, in ways that would seem magical to yeah, us. Yeah, it's completely non-local to mm -hmm. us, right? Yeah. But that for them is normal. <laughs> Nor normal. It would be like saying that we live in uh, the Star Trek holodeck, that, yes. that there's a higher dimension out there controlling things yes. that we experience in, in this dimension. Yes, exactly, totally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just wanted to emphasize uh, something we were discussing before in this discussion, the importance of uh, fruits, right? Uh, mm -hmm. My spiritual pragmatist speaking yes. again, right? Uh, right. Regardless the ontological status of these entities, regardless if they are projections of the mind or, or somehow manifestations of our collective psychic powers or independent entities or co-created entities yeah. or all the possibilities, you yeah. know, if those encounters uh, do bring us like benefits and healing, you know, yeah. I and mean, that in itself is fascinating and significant and important and something worth to research. Well, I, I think there's plenty of evidence on, on the healing end of, of things. Many books have been written about the phenomenon of, of spirit doctors and, and shamanism and uh, presumably miraculous mm -hmm. healings. Yes. But there's also, as, as a criminologist, <laughs> I am well aware of uh, people like the Son of Sam oh, and see. others who claim that they, they hear voices telling mm -hmm. them to commit murders. Sure. And, I know I met many years ago a psychologist named mm -hmm. Wilson Van Dusen. Mm -hmm. He was yes. the chief right. psychologist at Napa State Hospital mm -hmm. in uh, California. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called The Presence of Spirits in the World of Madness. Mm -hmm. And he took these voices mm -hmm. that the psychotic hospitalized mm -hmm. patients mm -hmm. were hearing. Mm -hmm. And he uh, based on the uh, theories of, of the Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, right. who wrote extensively about spiritual mm -hmm. entities and was a scientist himself, mm -hmm. uh, a very great scientist in mm -hmm. his own day, mm -hmm. although it was 18th century, mm -hmm. uh, he believed that the problem that these schizophrenic and psychotic patients were experiencing mm -hmm. is, is that they were being plagued by negative entities, and he noticed that they also had positive mm -hmm. entities who were working with them to try to help them to deal with the negative entities. Who knows, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I want to witness um, uh, someone I knew very closely, like going through a um, kind of a psychotic break uh, with someone who... Yeah. was diagnosed with a borderline personality disorder and it really looked to me uh, like a demonic possession yeah. i mean it's i felt like wow this is what in medieval times mm -hmm. it was like demonic possession you know like yes. uh, the personality change the the the, the, the the, the poison that comes to the mouth, the, mm -hmm. the self-abuse, the, the threats, the, the whole thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Stanislav Grof also has some reports of his work with uh, uh, very uh, ill people in, in psychiatric institutes in Maryland, you know, in which, you know, 
they were giving them LSD, you know, and uh, they were sending to him like people who they have tried everything, right? Yeah. And they said, well, no drug, LSD, mm-hmm. let's see, you know. And he reports sometimes like encounters like exactly like some, some things from, from a person who had been spoken for years, you know, like was yeah. like one of those kind of type of schizophrenia, you know, that they, they are completely like a catatonic, yes. you know. Suddenly like a very articulated voice came through and look him in his eyes, like completely rational and say, don't take him away from me. Mm-hmm. I mean, stuff like that. Yes. I mean, how to make, <laughs> what, what to make of this yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Kind well, of I've done a few interviews right. with, with professionals who yes. deal with yeah, these exactly. situations. <laughs> if, if people look at the listings yes. and New Thinking Aloud uh, under Terence Palmer, he, uh-huh. he uh, practices a, a form of uh, therapy he calls spirit release mm-hmm. therapy to, to gently, not through yes. some kind of forced exorcism and, yes. you know, holding up the cross and, yes. you know, banishing you to the fires of hell. Nothing yes. like that, but helping uh, ent- possessive entities mm-hmm. to uh, find their own path mm-hmm. to move into the light. And uh, mm-hmm. very often mm-hmm. in these situations, they describe, the, they ga- engage in conversation mm-hmm. with the entity when when the patient is in a hypnotic trance, for mm-hmm. example, and the mm-hmm. entity may begin to describe certain karmic connections, huh. reasons why they're there that need to be resolved before they can leave. Fascinating. And, I, I mean, it's actually uh, quite a big field. There, there are many mm-hmm. practitioners uh, and mm-hmm. books out about th- these forms of therapy. Mm-hmm. I think this is maybe one of the, perhaps uh, I will be seeing in the future as one of the blindness sports of uh, not only contemporary psychotherapy in general, but for example, of the new psychedelic renaissance, mm-hmm. right, that we're living now, you know, that they are finding like, oh yeah, we have all these substances and uh, that this seems to be healing people and stuff, but it's kind of this scientific, narrow scientific research that has zero taken into account the, the possible influence yeah. through those medicines, you know, of mm-hmm. factors like contact with healing entities yeah. or healing variables that are beyond the, you know, the, you know, the f- neurophysiology of the brain and Mm -hmm. uh, the chemical composition of the drug, right? Well, I think uh, in our previous discussion Mm -hmm. called Science and the Supernatural, we Mm -hmm. talked about how there's been a a tendency in Western science Mm -hmm. that if something has the aura of supernatural about it, it must be phony. Exactly. There's no further need to even look at it because because anything supernatural would be considered impossible by Mm -hmm. the philosophy known as naturalism. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Especially when it's taken as a, as a doctrine, as a dogma, you know, because uh, there is there's some scientists that they hold naturalism uh, methodologically, as a methodology. It's like, mm-hmm. But when you hold it as a metaphysics, you know, yeah. that's the problem. This is that this, this cannot exist because uh, the only thing that exists is the natural world that we can see and our, our machinery can, can Especially access. Especially when we now have thousands mm-hmm. of, of reports I call them empirical reports, Mm -hmm. people such as you. Yes, you were under Mm -hmm. the influence of a uh, substance, Mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you witness these things mm-hmm. and other people confirmed mm-hmm. what you witnessed that's data mm-hmm. and to take data like that and yes. to throw it out the window to me is unscientific yeah, absolutely I totally agree and uh, and I really look forward f- to a kind of research that uh, is kind of really also post-colonial and it's a research that is cross-cultural you know it's a research that uh, is not only scientific in the narrow sense that we in the West have been cultivated in science but it also takes into account other forms of epistemologies and uh, approaches to solid knowledge from mm-hmm. other cultures, you know. Yeah. And I look forward, like, uh, you know, when, when scientists and philosophers and psychologists sit with healers or lamas and meditators and, uh, and, and together as in collaboration mm-hmm. in a symmetrical way, not with, oh, well, we know that these guys are primitive and their claims, I know that, yeah. you know, it's mambo jambo, you know, that's the attitude. And really, like, open themselves to this uh, dialogical inquiry. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something that has never happened. 
dialogical inquiry. That, yeah. Can you define that term? Well, I would say it's like a kind of like a collective indagation uh, that is built into dialogue conversation, but uh, it's not just, it's a dialogue that uh, is like, um, uh, it's following a thread of inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, maybe by a question, for example, would be in this context, what's the ontological nature of spiritual entities? Yeah. You know, there would be a particular focus question, uh -huh. and then uh, all those people would come together and uh, in different ways could try to yeah. to dialogue about that particular inquiry threat and, and based on my knowledge of your approach I would say that that one of the ground rules need to be that people treat each other as equals yes that, that they some will be uh, wiser or smarter or more gifted in, in yes. one way or another but at the end of the day they can all learn from each other exactly and, uh, and of course we all make, make mistakes I'm sure that many of the things I've been saying in these interviews will prove to be wrong at some point by yeah. other people or some people can have disagreements and that, all that is healthy all that is healthy mm -hmm. like uh, and it's welcoming you know, when someone proves you wrong, it's like, wow, this, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Because to, to, in my experience, this sort of, um, you called it colonial, mm -hmm. attitude in science, it doesn't just pertain to uh, Western and non-Western cultures. It pertains, right. for example, most psychology research is conducted by professors, and the research subjects are freshmen and, right. and, so <laughs> and sophomores <laughs> taking introductory courses That's and, right. and so they have a kind of uh, attitude of superiority because they're, they're researching their students exactly and so yes. it's very rare for researchers in mm -hmm. the behavioral sciences to treat yes. their research subjects as equals. Yes, that's why I'm a big fan and I've conducted a number of what uh, is called cooperative inquiries and mm -hmm. there's a whole new participatory research methods paradigms, you know. Uh, the creator of cooperative inquiries, uh, someone called John Heron, who is now in Australia, a British psychologist, you know, he also created peer-to-peer -peer inquiry mm -hmm. or peer-to-peer -peer counseling. But anyway, in a cooperative inquiry, basically, is more is along those lines, like you yeah. you and other people, and could be your students in class, and there is a power differential, you can really, like, it's totally different that you doing experiments on subjects, you know. Yeah. They are co-inquirers. Mm -hmm. They're not called subjects, co-inquirers. And you together with them you decide collaboratively what's the question or questions that we want to inquire together. Yeah. What are the tools? How are we going to go about it? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be action in the world, mm -hmm. part of that kind of inquiry, reflection, cycles of reflection and action. Mm -hmm. And and that's a very rich. It's very rich. It really treats uh, other human beings as who they are, like co-inquirers versus like subjects, you know. Right, or objects <laughs> in the worst case scenario. <laughs> so what, what you're saying is if we're going to be able to address a very deep topic mm -hmm. uh, from a serious investigative uh, inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, whether we call it science or not, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter mm -hmm. uh, to me because we're opening up uh, a, a new world in a way. What you, you're suggesting yes. a kind of reorientation mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the identity that researchers have themselves in order to begin to experience that. They've certainly got to let mm -hmm. go of this culturally superior attitude that anyone who reports a spiritual yes. entity is either a, a fool or yes. uh, deluded. Exactly. And this has been like the, the the prevalent attitude in the West, not only in science but even in religious studies. You know yeah. uh, that they and, and anthropology that they study those phenomena and those cultures and uh, the, the you know there's the perspective of the outsider yeah. and this and the, the you know the insider is just the people in the natives you know the people who are doing these things. But where's outsiders? We know better what's really going on in a tantric ritual, regardless of what they are saying. We know better what's really going on in an ayahuasca ceremony, regardless mm -hmm. of what they are saying. This is epistemic violence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is epistemic colonialism. Yeah. This is like uh, this is very problematic mm -hmm. attitude, and uh, I think that more and more anthropologists and researchers are starting to change. Mm -hmm. There is like a sea of change in mm -hmm. contemporary academia in that regard, and post-colonial, decolonial scholarship mm -hmm. has helped a lot, but there's still a long mm -hmm. way to go. I, I suppose uh, before we conclude, it's probably worth mentioning that in addition to the many kinds of spiritual entities we've talked about, mm -hmm. there's also the idea of deities. Yes. And, and there's also the idea of aliens. Yes. So, uh, 
uh, it's a very rich area for exploration. And yes. It may well be that uh, the human race has the possibility of entering into some kind of dialogical relationship with entities that, that are vastly more advanced. Absolutely. And, you know, and many indigenous people I know, like, they claim that they already have done that. The star people. For centuries. Yeah. They claim that they have uh, uh, interactions and they have learned from them and also have exchanged knowledge. Yeah. They have a long-term, like, decades, centuries of, uh, and you can see even some of the iconography of some of these, mm -hmm. uh, you can see, like, say, a force or uh, creatures that look like aliens, you know. Yeah. The people are very clear. Oh, yes, aliens, yeah, they're part of our ceremonies. Sometimes they come, sometimes yeah. they don't. So this is happening, reportedly happening, yeah. and are we, are we bold and, and, and receptive and humble enough to open ourselves to, to those possibilities, uh, while keeping, you know, our, the powers for critical minds, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's what we need, like a rare blend of humility and openness and, 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 and critical discernment. Well, Jorge Ferrer, <laughs> once again, a fascinating discussion, and you really helped to illuminate a difficult topic. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that we can all help to illuminate it because it's a very, it's a very obscure topic still for most researchers. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for being with me, mm -hmm. and thank you for coming to Albuquerque for all of these interviews. My uh, pleasure. And, and my mm -hmm. pleasure, too. And thank you for being with us as well.